Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Sullison. With me, as always, is my very, very talented friend who deserves a star on Hollywood Boulevard, if you ask me. <laughs> I was just checking to see if you're awake. <laughs> it's amazing. So, Gina, I know you know who Rin Tin Tin is, right? Yeah, uh, yes. But did you know he received his own Hollywood star in 1960? I did not know that. But wait, I want to back up just a little bit, though. All right? Because his story is a little bit of a rags to riches story. According to history, according to my research on the Googles, he was discovered by a soldier in World War I who insisted his battalion check out a kennel that had just been bombed. In, in, he was in France. And once he was inside, Corporal Lee Duncan and his troops found um, the only survivors, unfortunately, the only survivors of this bombing were a mother German shepherd and her five puppies. Of course, they didn't leave them. They took all the dogs back to the, to the camp. And Duncan chose a boy pup. He named him Rin Tin Tin. And he trained him to perform the tricks that he had seen the working dogs in Germany perform. After the war... Luckily, Duncan returned home to L.A. and he continued Rin Tin Tin's training, uh, which led to Rin Tin Tin being entered into a dog show where he wowed the audience. Um, apparently, he jumped like 11 feet, 9 inches. That would have wowed me. Wow. I know. No kidding. And after the show, Duncan was approached by a film producer about his amazing pup. And this chance meeting, this chance meeting gave way to Rin Tin Tin's amazing career and becoming an international motion picture star. He gained immediate box, box office success, and he went on to appear in 27 films, which gained him worldwide fame. At the peak, this is funny, at the peak of his career, he was receiving more than 10,000 fan letters a week. Yeah, think of the time. Those were like handwritten, stamped, mail, like letters sent through the snail mail, um, but 10,000 10, a week. And he also is credited in this, you know, it may be up for debate. They believe that he may have actually kept Warner Brothers Studio from actually going out of business. They were near bankrupt, but he was one of their top stars and was able to pull such an audience that it may have changed the direction of the studio. Wow. I did not know any of that. And here's one last thing. There were a lot of Rin Tin Tins. Um, his sibling or his, his children went on to play Rin Tin Tin, maybe not as successfully as he did, but uh, it went on through generation to generation. Um, so apparently he believed in keeping it in the litter, if you will. Nah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know me, I got to end it with a bad dad joke. <laughs> I know, the dad jokes. I love it. So, speaking of superstars who deserve to have their names in lights, brings me to today's designated drinkers. Yes, I said drinkers. So please welcome to the show, from the Animal Welfare League of Alexandria, the executive director, Stella Hanley, and the director of marketing and communications, Gina Harder. Welcome to the show, show ladies. Hi, thank Bye. you for having us. So... Did you know all that um, that back history on Rin Tin Tin? I knew zero of that about Rin Tin Tin. I'll give it 5%. <laughs> I believe I had heard that he and his family had been found in a bombing. That's it. <laughs> Yeah. So actually, the truth is, is doing a little bit of the research or quite a few stories. This is the one I chose to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. I like this version. So, you know, take a few liberties. Who knows? Um, so, ladies, tell us what, tell us all about the Animal Welfare League, will you? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I'm Stella Hanley. I'm the executive director here at the Animal Welfare League of Alexandria. And we would like to say that we are community focused animal welfare. So, we focus on supporting pets and the people who love them here in the city of Alexandria and beyond. Um, so, support with adoptions, um, if you can no longer keep your pet um, with spay neuter assistance, veterinary assistance, pet country assistance. And because we run animal services for the city of Alexandria, we also help with wildlife. And there is an awful lot of wildlife in the city as well. 
So we help with that too. Wildlife. I never knew that you that wildlife came into that picture. Yeah, absolutely. So we're not a rehab facility. So technically, um, if wildlife is hurt and it's fined in the city, then we would transfer it to a licensed rehabber. But our officers are out and about, um, especially at this time of year when there's lots of baby animals. Um, so educating uh, the community about usually leaving animals where they are, <laughs> usually better to let mama take care of them. Um, they don't always need human intervention unless they're, they're sick or injured. But we do a lot of wildlife calls as well. That's interesting. You know, I, it, honestly, I last year, uh, my dogs, my dogs were going nuts, going, you know, just losing their damn mind. And I was like, what the? And I go out there, I'm like, shh, shh, no one will listen to me. I look out my front door. And the reason why is there's an eight, eight point buck standing out my, in front of my door. I live in an urban setting. The fact that there's an eight point buck at my door. It, yeah. Startled me as well as all my dogs and rightfully so. Um, I will say that I did not call anyone to let them know because I knew what was happening and how he ended up here. I was worried that somebody would do any, you know, it might be because he, he could cause humans to be in, in danger or they may think so. I just let him go off and he was fine. He, he went back to wherever he was going, but it was pretty amazing. My dogs literally lost their damn mind. And I, of course, was outside in my robe taking pictures. And at one point I'm like, I don't know if I want to be hooved to death. You know, that's a, that's a sad obituary. <laughs> you did exactly the right thing. Just letting him go about his business. That was exactly, but a funny little anecdote. What we noticed um, when the quarantine happened or started last year, when everybody started working from home, we had a huge uptick in calls for wildlife during the day. And it was because people were noticing things on their deck. They were saying, there's a raccoon out in daylight. And we'd be like, the raccoon is probably always there, but you're not. So that's the difference. But it was tremendous, the, uh, the number of calls that we got when quarantine started for that. Just people observing wildlife, just letting us know there is wildlife in the city. <laughs> so it's good. Do you help people find their lost chicks? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Gina, <laughs> fill them in. <laughs> yeah. um, we get a lot of calls about baby birds found, and we see about helping reconnect them with their mothers. But in terms of chickens, that's not something that we're generally seeing in the community. This is funny to have two Ginas on the show. And uh, my Gina, tell, tell, fill in the blank there. <laughs> so this morning, one of my um, junior chickens got out of our fence and is wandering the perimeter of our, I live up in um, Maryland, is wandering the perimeter of our house, and I can't get it to get inside. And she went off into the woods, and we can hear her, you know, I'm, I'm terrified for her, but I tried to get her, and I tried to find her, but, like, I can only hear her chirping. I don't know where she is. Oh, no. I know. You should call, you should call your animal services. We or did. We, call, we called and they said to give it a few hours because um, it's early in the season. And they said that she should, she'll wander, she should be able to wander back. Cool. But uh, I know it's terrifying. You, like when you raise, this is going to be summer. I, 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 in a million years, I am from New York City. And now it's my first year with a flock. And I am, and it's only 16 birds and it's a lot of birds, I think. I, I'm attached to them, so I've been outside like trying to get her to come back, and I put mealworms. I've done every single thing, and I can hear her. I feel like she's under a wood pile, and she can get in and out. We saw her pop her head out, but what I'm afraid of is that there is a fox that lives down by the other pond, and I haven't seen him in a few days, so he may not be around here, but God, I just, I, I just hope that she'll, like, when I go back outside, that she'll She'll be back at the door and we can just let her in, but we'll see. Hopefully she's just having a fun adventure with you guys right now and she'll be back before nightfall. Yeah, she's young. She's only, you know, she's a junior, so she's oh. only six weeks old. She's, you know, she, yeah, she only has her first set. She's not even molted all the way yet, so I know. I, I w um, we should say, seeing as we are focused in the city of Alexandria, that poultry is not a lot in the city of Alexandria. So much as we're talking about chickens, Anybody who's listening thinking they would like to get their own flock of chickens, that that is, that is not permitted in the city. Do you know that here's a crazy thing that um, 
partly because Gina was getting chickens. And the other thing is because my husband is trying to figure out what he might send his brother's children that would be um, noisy. Ch chicken. <laughs> he was looking for gifts. And that's when Dave did some research and I sent it to Gina. And you can actually rent in certain cities. And they're doing it in, I was kind of surprised in the city limit space, but it's definitely only specific cities that you can send a, they'll send a coop, like a, a portable chicken coop and chickens that you can rent. And I think it's part of the, it kind of got, it's pushed during the pandemic when people were like, oh, well, I need to make, I need to have my own eggs. Uh, but yeah, you can actually rent rent the chickens. It's kind of like instead of rent the runway where you get your <laughs> your evening gowns, you get your chickens. Oh, rent a coop. Rent a, yeah, rent a coop. Do you send the chickens back? That's weird. Yes. So you get to keep the eggs. Yeah. So you get them for like a weekend. Oh. You get the you get the birds for a weekend, and then you bring them back. And they started it for um for kids to learn about you know birds. But I, I'm gonna be honest. I live 44 miles um, north of DC, and I and I go to um, DC every like every other day. And chickens are a lot of work, and they need a lot of space. So you know, even if you are allowed to have them, really look at your backyard and say, "Is this big enough?" Because they like to wander, they love to eat bugs, they like to pack. They're just natural. So if you are contemplating that, and you're looking at your yard, and you're like, "Oh, how much square footage do I have?" You know, really do the math because these birds really do um, need a lot of space. So, and to raise them properly. Chances are you don't have what you need. Is that what you're saying, Gina? <laughs> I just don't, I think it's cruel yeah. to cramp up any Absolutely. animal. So, no, I just, you know. You're 100% right. You need to, for any time, I, you know, yeah. we're both big animal advocates. And um, even before we get to the ladies who work at Animal Welfare League, we would be like, absolutely, know, know your space. Be Being kind to animals is important in making sure that you're taking care of their welfare. Don't be a selfish animal owner. So, off my soapbox, tell us more what, uh, you know, especially during the pandemic, it's a little harder to be able to to volunteer in certain spaces. What can people do to help their own, their own space and rescues. If they're not even, you know, our listeners come from all around the country. What else, what can they do? Yeah. So probably a lot of shelters are doing things differently. Some people have, um, some shelters have people in the facility. Some people have opportunities for them outside of the facility. Obviously, first and foremost, check in with your local shelter because they may have very specific things that they're looking for. But I would say a big one is um, seeing if they're interested in fostering because that's something that you can do from home and you can do it safely. So especially right now, as the weather gets warm, so many shelters are going to have just an influx of kittens. And who doesn't want to hang out with kittens for a couple weeks to a couple months before they get big enough to um, be adopted? So that's an exciting opportunity. Some of them have work that you can do from home on your computer. You can help with organization. You can help with data. Obviously, supporting a local shelter financially is, um, since most of them are nonprofits, a lot of them need that level of support. So there's so much that you can do and all kinds of things you might have never thought of that a shelter needed. We have a local handyman who helps us out around here. So I would say call and find out. There's probably the perfect opportunity for you. Yeah, that was something I hadn't, when we spoke a couple of days ago, that was something I had never thought of, um, and that is using your unique skill set um, and applying what you have to offer, even though it may not seem um, traditional, or, you know, can you, like you said, can, are you a good carpenter? Can you make things happen? Are you a photographer? Obviously, great pictures of animals helps them get into their forever home, um, or by even finding a foster. Don't get me wrong. When I fostered Cam, it was because there was a baby sitting on on him and I was like absolutely um and three three <laughs> years later he's still here uh total foster fail but yeah thinking about what you what you uniquely can offer although it may not seem traditional um there's a lot that you guys need it sounded like yeah I mean most shelters that have volunteers those volunteers do the work of a dozen or more employees and it just means expanding the level of care that they can provide so if you have a talent if you have something you love doing it I bet your local shelter or rescue can definitely use that ability. All right, Gina, let's get a little lubed and start thinking about what we can creatively do for these animals. How about we make a cocktail? We will. I And I want to, but I want to just know, how do you know that you want to work at a rescue shelter? I mean, how did you do this? Like, I'm, cu I'm curious because like, I love animals, but that's not all it takes. So 
How did you start that? Or how did you get into this? Well, we both came into it kind of oddly. Um, so I'm originally from Northern Ireland and I 100% thought that I wanted to work with animals growing up, but there's not really a lot of opportunity to make a career of it unless you wanted to be a veterinarian. And I 100% did not want to be a veterinarian. So I actually was a software developer and that's what transferred me over to the state. Um, so it was a... Uh, you know, my visa originally was a skilled worker visa um, as a software engineer. And whenever I got here, I saw there was a lot more opportunity in the animal welfare space. And I, I figured that I would try and maneuver my way to do that. Um, so I ended up doing a master's degree in nonprofit management. And from there, I moved to the Aspen Institute. So that was my first foray into nonprofit work. But I knew that I really, really wanted to do something more hands on um, and I really wanted to work with animals. So um, an, a position came up at the Washington Humane Society, which is now Humane Rescue Alliance in D.C. And I essentially met the hiring manager and just I essentially begged her to give me a chance. I said I don't have any experience in the sheltering world tons of animal experience, but not professionally. Um, and she did. So I became a volunteer manager there um, and then was director of community engagement before I moved over here to the um, Animal Welfare League of Alexandria. So mine is kind of a different way. Most people, I would say, um, work their way up from animal care tech up through the ranks. Um, but most people who do that tend to not have the organization or leadership background that you still need in a nonprofit as well. So um, so it was interesting. I, I honestly truly do wake up sometimes and think I can't believe that I am the executive director of the Animal Welfare League of Alexandria because it is truly like whenever I was 10, I it's what I wanted, but I don't think I was ever able to articulate it, you know, that this is what I want to do. And the ability to know every single day that you're making a difference in the lives of animals and people means that coming into work is, it's not, it doesn't feel like work. It truly doesn't. And I know that people say that probably, but it really, really, really doesn't. And that little saying, um, love what you do, and it won't feel like work. I think that that's true. It's very, very true. But anyway, I'll let Gina talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think Stella kind of covered it. I had a similar background in that I wanted to work with animals as a kid. When I was applying for this job, my mom found some weird little book that I made when I was a kid because I was a really nerdy kid as opposed to now when I'm a really nerdy adult. <laughs> it was some book that I made about like how I loved animals and I wanted to work with animals. And then as I became an adult, I didn't think that was a thing that I could do. Um until I adopted my first dog from here, actually from the AWLA. And I saw what they did and all the different people they had here and just how passionate they were. And I was like, that's what I want to do. So first I volunteered for about five years because I just wanted to see how things work. I want to do something with animals. And when a position came up here in the communications department, I knew that had my name on it. And I, much like Stella, I told many, many people <laughs> that they could not do better than me. And hopefully their cry was correct. But I've been here for about four years and it has been amazing. And every day I come in, there's dogs in my office or cats in my office. It's exactly what I never knew I always dreamed of. That's awesome. That that's I think to your point, whatever it is that makes you really passionate. And, and makes you wake up in the morning and puts that smile on your face. Of course, we can maybe hate the job from time to time, but if you love the work, it's, it's, I think it's the key to uh, uh, happiness for me. I will say to people, though, if um, financial reward is, is where <laughs> your motivation is, this is possibly not, not the job for you. <laughs> but if, if you get satisfaction in other ways, then absolutely. It's, I, I, it's tremendous. It's a tremendous place to work. Awesome. So shall we toast these ladies, Gina? Yes. I just, I had to know before we made the drink. No worries. So we're going to make a cocktail today called Rescue Me. And I obviously was inspired by the both of you. And I, a little birdie told me that you like vodka. And vodka could be anything, right? So I thought it'd be really fun to kind of like challenge um, the ingredients really for this one because... Um, you can mimic, you can make this drink into anything, and really, what it is is a crush. So, 
what we're going to do to start off with this cocktail, and I'm using pineapple, and I want to say this. If you have a different melon, um, pine, you know, you want to use pineapple, melon, watermelon, um, any of that will work. You're going to use about three ounces of pineapple chunks or or roughly three about three ounces. And you, so I'm going to show you a little trick. You take the, the pineapple, and instead of trying to muddle it, you can just use your little hand juicer that you might have at home or a muddler, either or. And you're going to squeeze the juice into a wine goblet or a glass or a solo cup or a greenware or whatever you have. You don't need anything fancy to make a cocktail. You just need something that holds liquid, right? And try not to get it on your computer when you're doing Zooms because that's a bad thing. So that's what I just did. All right. So you're going to put this in there. And if you notice, once you squeeze this or you're muddling it in your glass, you have quite a bit of juice and that has a bunch of sugar already in it. So we're going to use a quarter ounce of simple syrup and you can use any simple syrup. So if you happen to have, you know, hibiscus, I don't know, pineapple, regular simple syrup, um, anything, anything you can work in this cocktail. So we're putting those in there. Now we're going to add, and this is important and I know it sounds really silly, but you're going to add the sugar, pineapple, the simple syrup. This is going to sound really silly. This is going to sound really silly, but you have the pineapple, the simple syrup already in here. And now is the point where you're going to add your alcohol uh, for one and a half ounces of vodka. If you want to make this drink a little bit lighter, you absolutely can and just use one ounce of vodka when you're using sparkling wine. If you wanted to use soda water with this, you can do that as well. Um, it's a very forgiving cocktail. Now I said to get a sprig of mint. So the mint that I'm using today is a little, is a tangerine mint. The ingredients in here are, you know, really up to you. You know, be as playful as you want. Um, I would, you know, you're using a spearmint. I wouldn't use so many, um, but about four to five leaves. And now you're going to take your crushed ice. Now you made this little layer of pineapple, simple syrup, your vodka. And now we're going to take crushed ice or any ice or a block of ice or, you know, whatever you got at home is fine. And you're going to put it on the top and we're going to take some lemon wheels and with your bar spoon, you're just going to kind of push them in to make like a really, you know, attractive cocktail. So you're pushing them down and um, because we're doing a rescue cocktail, think of, you know, those little, uh, you know, fish that get trapped in the ice and you're trapping your lemons in the ice and we're going to save them or something. I don't know. I just made all that up. I have no idea if fish get trapped in ice and need rescuing. <laughs> So we're going to push this uh, in there and you have them all trapped in there and you're going to finish your drink with either club soda or sparkling wine. I love, um, I saw that the ladies are, um, Stella and Gina are using um, rosé, which is amazing. I am going to use a bit of club soda only because I did not open a bottle of champagne uh, for myself because I'm alone today. If you didn't hear, there's no children in the background. So it's real nice. And I don't think that chickens drink um, vodka. But who knows? <laughs> they are my I, birds. You never know. That may yeah. be the way she, you get her back. How do you get her back? Maybe that's what you need. You put some, uh, maybe she's that's a designated right. drinker chick. Yeah. And then we're going to take, yeah, <laughs> like right? we're gonna take, we're gonna take the um, <laughs> little bit of the menu because we put it on top for garnish. And remember, you know, you're at home. You're making this drink for you and your loved ones. You're not behind the bar with chick. You know, you want to make this beautiful. You know, making drinks nice for yourself is nice too. So, anyway, absolutely. If this doesn't rescue you, I, I don't know what will during the pandemic. So, cheers. Oh, it looks good. The pink is nice. It's like a sunset, right? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And we were told bring fancy wine glasses. And so for my house, what I brought was the fanciest wine glasses I have, which is stemless wine glasses that say things about dogs. So mine says, what does it say? very accurately, I work hard so my dog can have a better life. Dogs can have a better life, but this is my sentiment entirely. And mine says, it's not really drinking alone when your dog is home. Oh, <laughs> it's a very important I have sentiment. Tea, I have tea towels that say that one. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, it's good. Oh, that's good. I did a sparkling rosé as well, Gina. Um, this is really nice. This is like drink all day kind of drink. It's really refreshing. This is perfect for the season. It's um, and it's a great pitcher cocktail. And um, we can put that on the uh, when we do the cocktails 
When we give you the recipes at designateddrinker.show for all the tips and tricks and how-tos, we'll also give a picture recipe. If you're going to have more people over your house and you don't really want to be you know, the, the bartender when you're having you know, your new vaccinated friends, your newly vaccinated friends over. It's been a long time. so Or fundraisers for animal shelters, which would be really nice. I feel like that's a good idea too. Anyway... You could actually do newly vaccinated, new vaccinated fundraisers for animals right in your house. You could just com- combine that all. Just It's kind of like making this drink in a, in a pitcher. You just take all those ideas, put them in with some ice. So basically, you make your <laughs> friends drinks, then get them to the link for the Alexander Seltzer, and then they can hit donate after you get them a little, little drunk. I got it. I like the whole idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good strategy. As long as I don't have to clean my house, I'm all in for this one. Totally. (laughs) So again, just for the listeners, just so you know, you're going to designateddrinker.show for all of Gina's tricks and how-tos. And we're also going to have um, links to the Animal Welfare League here in Alexandria. Um, and, and definitely get that uh, donation going. Um, but if you're not in our area, we highly recommend you find a way, if you can, to donate either your time or a little bit of cash um, to your local shelter. And adopt many dogs. I could never do your job because I would end up with 182 dogs. I know I would. I, animals, period. I could, I could, I, every one of them, I'd be like, come on home. I don't know. How, how do you not do that? How do you not just like become like an animal hoarder and on, on the Discovery Channel or Bravo TV or wherever that show is? <laughs> people do. That is the number one thing that people always say, you know, I can't come because I would want to adopt everybody. But honestly, um, it, the facility is really happy. Um, the vast, vast, vast majority of our animals get adopted. And so it's really nice to be part of that journey and to see them going home with their new family. Um, And, you know, everybody knows their own lifestyle um, and you know which animal would be best for you. So (laughs) the vast majority would not be good for me, I can tell you. Um, And so we know that, you know, but we're really happy to help them find um, the family that would suit them better. So. I only want to take an animal home, truly. Gina's Every the worst. Three to four months, <laughs> yeah. I would say. Um, and I have a tag team at home. It's my husband and one of my dogs. We're both like, no, mm-hmm. no, no. So it's like a support system that's not supporting me, but it's helping. I actually, I should say Gina's not the worst because I keep putting animals on adoption hold and then going home and saying to me, my husband, he's, he says the same thing, no. We're not doing it. So it, it is good having um, somebody at home. Yeah. A voice of reason. Knowing that, <laughs> I also, I have a dog at home who has absolutely no interest in a canine sibling. So do you think, do a lot of, I'm, I'm curious, what a lot of people, when they surrender their dogs, is it because they're elderly or something like that? Like, and then they're not always the saddest stories, right? No, they're. the, uh, the number one reason is uh, moving to a place where they're not allowed pets. Um, so I think that we're trying to work with other um, human service organizations in the city. There is no rental accommodation that allows um, bully type dogs here in the city of Alexandria. So unless you own your own home or you're renting privately, you can't own a dog of that type. Um, but then there's also weight restrictions as well as breed restrictions. Um, and you know, if you have to move, you have to move. And if you can't find accommodation for your pet, it's it's heartbreaking. So that is the number one reason why animals are surrendered. Yeah, you mentioned they're not always sad stories. And that's definitely the case. One of the things is we try to be very non-judgmental because we know there's a, re- a variety of reasons people need to bring animals back to us, including just like still. And I mentioned it's not the right match. And that's fine. That means we have an opportunity to find a right match for everyone, for that animal, for that person. So first and foremost, we just want to be here as a resource for them, whatever the reason they need to surrender. And if there's something we can do to help with that situation, like provide supplies or low cost spay meter surgery, we are also here to do that because if we can keep families together, that's even better. Yeah, that that is our priority. We do. It's called intake diversion. Um, So we don't want your animals. We 100% don't want them. So if it's something simple, 
that we can do to help you. We would much prefer to leave the animal with a loving home and with the family that they love rather than have to take them in. That's great to know that there are uh, services. I'm sure a lot of people find themselves, um, especially now after the pandemic or during the pan, not after, I wish we were after, um, where people are, are struggling, they're financially struggling. And it's, it, it, I think that sometimes people forget that it, it's hard to ask for help, I guess, is what it boils down to. And to know that you have help, even for, for the animals that are in your life, if you're struggling, there are resources for you to help keep that, that loving pet in your, in your family. Yeah, it was uh, very apparent at the start of April last year. Um, it started with the restaurant workers um, because they work shift to shift and they did not have money for pet food. And so the um, I think our requests to the pet pantry in April were 700% over what they had been in previous months. But we're wow. incredibly lucky with the community that we live in because we did run out of donations to redistribute. And so we put out a plea to ask people to help their neighbor, essentially. Um, and the, the amount of donations that we received that we could redistribute to people in the community was just unbelievable. And any time that we ask for help, the community rallies and gives us help. Um, and the majority of the time, we're not asking for help for us, we're asking for help for the community. Um, so we kind of act as a hub to distribute supplies and, and provide any support that people need. That's awesome. Yeah, last year we were able to provide 40,000 pounds of supplies across the community, which, you know, kitty litter is pretty heavy, but that's still quite a bit of supplies. It mostly came from the community, but it also means that people who you were talking about who are they don't have funds they're having to make difficult choices if it means that they have to decide between buying groceries for themselves or buying groceries for their pet now they don't need to make that decision we can get the food that they need for their pet and they can make sure they have what they need to take care of themselves i was just going to say when you're going through a hard time the last thing you want to do is usually um usually your pet is your support system so the last thing that you want to do is um, have to give up that support system. And so we know that, you know, I don't know what I would do without my dog. So I can't imagine anybody making that decision because they couldn't afford pet food. And so it just feels really good to be able to help so they can stay together. I think that's really lovely and beautiful. I've, I've seen a lot of um, in D.C. sometimes you'll see, you know, um, homeless or or people that live in shelters and they have dogs and that those dogs, I, I, I feel bad for both the situations, but you, sometimes, you know, people might be mental, have a mental illness or suffered a tragedy or something that wound them, um, without a home and their love for their animal with them is just, I can't imagine like having to give it up. Right. So, I'm I'm so happy that you do that. I didn't know that that was part of the money when you give to shelters, that they give food for people that can't afford the food so the pets stay with the family. That's really beautiful, actually. Another part of that program is our crisis care program. So if somebody is experiencing temporary homelessness or a temporary emergency, hospitalization, domestic violence, um, we will house their pet um, temporarily um, until they get their back on their feet. So we will also help with that. But another um, program that we're getting more into this year, probably because of COVID, is um, it's the concept of One Health. So kind of what you were mentioning there about you see homeless people and probably they're spending their money taking care of their animal and not taking care of themselves. Well, One Health is a way to provide services for the animal because we know people will come to get services for their animal. But while they're there, we provide human services as well. So we have oh. an upcoming one um, partner, partnering with ARHA, which is the Alexandria Redevelopment Housing Authority, um, as well as the health department, where we will be providing um, rabies vaccines, distemper, grooming health, all that kind of thing for the animals. But as well as that, we are going to have uh, vaccine COVID vaccine signups from the health department. Um, with senior services will be there to help um, with elder care. Um, we'll have groceries from Alive that people will be able to pick up as well, at, all at the same event. Um, and it's, a, it's interesting that um, the hook is the animal part of it. 
because people will come to get the animal services and then that's a way for these other human services to let them know that they're available to them as well. That's amazing. I, that's I so that's, amazing. And, and to your point, yeah. like what is the hook? Is it the love for that animal is what will get somebody to come in and take care of themselves. Um, that's amazing. I, 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 you know, I, I have never really thought about the fact that just helping people, homeless people or people who are in need and to get the care that they needed. Um, you know, I often wondered how those animals were taken care of. I think this is so brilliant to be able to tie all those things together because those animals, just like mine, are a part of the, it, it's their family. Whenever I first started in animal welfare, um, somebody said to me, where there's an animal in trouble, there's a human in trouble. And I'd never thought of it like that before. And it's just something that I think all of us carry with us here that, you know, as, as Gina said, we try really to be very non judgmental because you have no idea what is going on in somebody else's life. And um, just knowing that if there is an animal to be able to reach out a hand and say, hey, we're here for you as well is really important. Um, the Animal Welfare League of Alexandria just um, a couple of months ago got designated as a safe place for youth in crisis. Um, so all of our staff have gone through training uh, for that as well. So if uh, as a child comes and needs help, that we will be able to help them and redirect them to the correct authorities. And I think that that's one of the proudest things that we've done this year is, again, trying to tie in the, the human and animal aspect um, that we're all connected. Yeah, animal may be in our title, but I feel like the welfare is the really important thing to us. And that's the welfare of everyone in our community, whether no matter how many legs they have, no matter if they have <laughs> fur, we're here for all of them. That's great. I, I, that, that, I think the, the, the child part to that it really makes sense for me, because when I was a kid, we had a great big red Doberman. And when I wasn't when things weren't good in the house, that's where you found me all the time. I was I was always with the dog. The dog was my my safe zone. That's where I went away to get away from the family arguments. Not, you know, not to make it sound really dark. But I mean, honestly, that's where I found uh, my refuge. Um, even if it were just my older sister beating the hell out of me uh, <laughs> because I said something smart ass. I know it'd be hard to believe. Uh, but yeah, my, my go-to was the dog. So I, I, could, I think that's really brilliant because there's just a safe space in there for kids, especially. Absolutely. Yeah. So when are we getting a dog for the girls, Gina? <laughs> <laughs> you can absolutely help you out. I've been, I've been. Know. We have two um, really cute dogs in Gina's office right now, and they have been child tested because my daughter comes to see them every Sunday and Monday because um, she wants. What kind of dogs are Chihuahua they? Chihuahua mixes, so they're little. They're called Chanel and Piwa yeah. or Cha Cha and Pee Pee. <laughs> let me step back and say they're in my office. I am not a small dog person. I have already run them by my husband who's given me the veto. Like, I love these dogs. I love them. They're, They're so amazing. amazing. And if you have multiple kids, there's multiple dogs yeah. here. Everybody can have their own personal dog. It's it's perfect. I was shocked, actually, because typically chihuahuas, you know, don't historically, maybe aren't the best with children. And so whenever I brought Aoife in, I was like, just, you know, she's pretty good with uh with dogs but i was like let give them their space and they ran up to her they wanted to sit in her lap if she sits down they jump up they give her kisses they absolutely adore her and she, uh, chanel we think might be piwa's mother but she looks like a little white potato with four <laughs> little legs Aww. she's so cute they're literally scratching on stella's office door right now <laughs> we're, we're gonna trying bring to them in for this but it was dinner time and they couldn't be distracted but right now they're like, excuse me, are people getting attention? We, we need to be in here. That's Thank awesome. You. That's awesome. Aww. I love that. They're wonderful. I, but they'd have to be, they'd have to be chicken uh, duckling fr uh, friendly though. That would have to be key. There's going to have, I need, um, you know, yeah, I was going to say, if you have any um, like Airedale uh, sheep dog, <laughs> herding dog that needs a home, and could be older, <laughs> like a farm dog, I'm in. It, these two are going to be smaller than your chickens. So what you get there is you're not going to mess with chickens. Because chickens will tell them once, no, thank you. I don't need your messing. And they'll just listen to it. Like maybe you need something that's going to let the chickens be the boss. Yeah. That's kind of funny. I've never, I've, I've never heard of chicken <laughs> training. That's, that, you know, that's kind of good. <laughs> they're very people focused. Yeah. So I don't think they would even notice the chickens because they're so interested in whether, who can get the most belly rubs. Are they on your website right now? Yeah, they are. Yeah. 
All right, we'll have direct links to those two little to little mamacitas. Yes. And they are a, they're a bonded pair, so they have to go home together. Aww. And they really are like two halves of the same whole. Aww. They're just so That's bonded, awesome. so That's awesome. they can't be separated. All right, Gina, we did our housekeeping, right? Yes, and then we have one more question, right? Yep, we do. It's all you. All right, ladies. So in this day and age, people identify themselves with a spirited animal, and I feel like maybe you identify yourself with a dove because they're so calm and tranquil and they're the symbol of peace. <laughs> but if you can identify yourself as one ingredient that would be used in cooking or cocktails, what would it be and why? Ooh, that's really tricky. Uh, you know, you said cooking, and the first thing that popped into my head is just, and it's basic, maybe I'm basic, <laughs> I don't know, salt. Everything she needs is, to taste like salt. She it is can salty. It she can, can be quite salty. It can taste like other things too, but man, that's salt. I, I want to be that salt. That's part of me, maybe I'm part of it. <laughs> love it. I think I, I think I would say chocolate. <laughs> Why? Just because a, a day never goes by that I don't want some chocolate. <laughs> so, yeah. so I don't know. I just, I don't know if it's really, that's me, but. Are you a little bitter and a little sweet too? Sure. Depends on the day. <laughs> Depends on the day. <laughs> well, I like that. I'm definitely, definitely not. There's not too much cocoa in this, in this chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Get that woman some sunblock. <laughs> exactly. <Yes. laughs> all right, ladies. All right, ladies. It's time. It is. We want to say thank you for all that you do and for inspiring us to do more for two-legged, four-legged, everyone who needs welfare. Thank you for giving us an idea of how we can participate and be a part of a fix, be a part of the solve. So thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for these wonderful drinks. Cheers. Cheers. And thanks for coming. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link line of a podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers, Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Links League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.